morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are located, be it uh, at home, in the office, or on the road, welcome to this very special webinar focused on U.S. offshore wind vessels building a sustainable fleet for a sustainable world. We do already have uh, over 300 online and I anticipate that we will have quite a few who will be joining us in the next few minutes. But since we have four fantastic individuals who will be joining me on screen here shortly, I do not want to delay the discussion and conversation too long. So we will go ahead and get started. My name is Myra Shannon Fuller. I am the communications manager for Hub America's Maritime at DNV, and it is my pleasure to be the host and moderator of today's joint industry event. Um, over the next hour, you'll be hearing from four of the top maritime experts in the industry, engaging in panel discussion surrounding the developing vessel markets supporting the offshore wind industry here in the U.S. Uh, before we get started, a couple of practicalities concerning the session today. Um, if you are not familiar with this go-to up in our platform that we are using, just to highlight for you, there is a control panel on your right-hand side of the screen. You will see an, or an orange arrow there, which will allow you to expand and collapse that control panel. Uh, we do hope to have enough time to get to some audience questions. So please submit your questions through the questions section of the control panel on your right. Um, as you noted, microphones are muted by default and your videos, of course, are not available for use. Um, so any questions that you have, please submit them through the questions panel. If your question is for a specific individual, if you would be so kind as to indicate who the question is for on your submission, that would help us to direct it to the right person. Um, and just as a matter of course, this session is being recorded and we will make a copy available for future replay. Now, Getting down to business, our panelists today. First up, we have Dave Lee of ABB, the Senior Account Manager of New Builds, who is responsible for overseeing and leading sales initiatives for the workboat industry and marine construction. Um, within his role, his expanded role, it includes the management of the offshore wind segment for the Americas. Uh, in particular, his focus on implementing sustainable solutions for offshore construction and support vessels. Dave continues to educate the market on environmental demands with the long-awaited expansion of offshore wind farms. The need for sustainable vessels is inevitable in the United States due to the Jones Act. The vessels needed for offshore construction and support vessels require unique expertise, and Dave is specifically skilled in all aspects of hybrid and electric system integrations. As you can see here, Dave um, is representing ABB. A bit of information concerning ABB and the offshore um, wind market and its relevance to the market is here on your screen. Um, we will also provide contact information for the individuals who are panelists during this session and follow up hereafter. Second, uh, my colleague Nick Prokopuk, who is the business development manager for DMB Region Americas Maritime based in Houston and responsible for DNB when it comes to special ships and offshore wind segment within that uh, for North America. You may have seen Nick's face on his blog series, hashtag Ask Nick About Offshore Wind, um, on LinkedIn, where he discusses topics important to the development of the industry within the United States, including infrastructure, regulations, turbine maintenance, and the vessels needed to support the market, the market as well. Uh, through his vlog series, Nick has become a bit of a spokesperson and champion for this vessel segment, uh, which is essential to the growth of the U.S. wind industry here in the U.S. Next up, we have Jeff Andrini, who is a 41-year veteran of Crowley Marine Services. Throughout his tenure, Jeff has worked both in operations and in the administration, responsible for the management of the U.S. West Coast tug commercial operations, global strategic development, finance and accounting for various divisions, uh, CFO for Corrali Marine Salvage Joint Venture, and in his current role as Vice President of New Energy, which brings him to the discussion table today. Uh, in this new position, Jeff is responsible for the global development of renewable energy, including offshore wind and Crowley's current LNG business in Puerto Rico. And last, but certainly not least, Mike Holcomb, the Senior Vice President for Marketing at Keppel Offshore and Marine. Mike is a graduate of the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy uh, with a BS in Marine Engineering. 
He has worked in test and trials uh, at Ingalls Shipyard and sailed as a licensed in engineer on U.S. merchant vessels. Joining Keppel, um, Keppel Offshore and Marine in 1991, he has since worked in business development roles where I think he'd say this market in particular is keeping him quite busy this, these days. And now getting down to business, uh, why we're here. And this term 30 by 30 is I think a phrase that's been coined and thrown around a bit, but really what does that mean? Um, well, I'm willing to bet the majority of you here on the session today have heard the administration's announcement in late March concerning uh, the mission to support and increase the wind development target here in the US. The deployment of 30 gigawatts of offshore wind is equivalent to roughly 2,500 turbines. Now there's a lot of other figures that are being discussed and I wish I could emphasize with a long roll of paper just how much this is, but I'm going to read very carefully to ensure that I get the thousands correct. Uh, from 12 billion in capital investment, it will spur annually leading to the construction of up to 10 new manufacturing plants for offshore wind turbine components, new ships to install offshore wind turbines, and up to $5 million in port upgrades. Achieving the 2030 goal will support 77,000 jobs, including more than 44,000 workers employed in offshore wind, and nearly 33,000 additional jobs in communities supported by offshore wind activities. It would also unlock a pathway to deploy 110 gigawatts or more of offshore wind by 2050, supporting an additional 135,000 total jobs, including 77,000 in offshore wind and 58,000 included in communities with offshore wind activity. So the panel today is focused in digging into the details here and sharing their insight in what this means specifically for the maritime industry and what needs to be done for the maritime industry to rise to this challenge, which is considered, I could say, perhaps an ambitious challenge, but what we can do to rise to this challenge uh, with much excitement and with much focus and with the critical factors of achieving the goal of 30 gigawatts by 2030, including US shipyard capacity, adapting existing European designs for the US to the local design developments, and the employment of US workers, as well as the impacts of the Jones Act. So with that, I'm going to welcome to the virtual stage, our panelists. If I could get you gentlemen to turn your cameras on and microphones as well. One, two, three. There we go. All right, well, welcome. Good afternoon, guys. How are we doing? Doing well. Very good. Very good. Well, let's open it up today. And I can see we've got uh, more than 500 online. So I know folks are not here to listen to me. They're here to listen to you. So we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll kick this off early. Um, question. The first question to start off with the right out the gate. What needs to be done for us to reach the 30 by 30 target? And maybe Nick, if we could start off with you for that one. Sure, sure. Thank you, Myra. So yeah, I mean, um, what you 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 mentioned in your intro, um, 30 gigawatts is going to be you know 2,500 or so turbines, an absolute massive amount, and it just comes with an enormous opportunity, enormous potential um, for this new industry coming to the U.S. If you know, we're talking today here about, of course, the maritime space. All of us are very active in that. If we look towards what was done in, in, in Europe to um, put in the existing 25 or so gigawatts, you know, we can estimate about 500 vessels in total were used for that. Um, you know, logic says that would apply about the same here in the US um, now with our, which we'll get into later, of course, in much more detail, our specific Jones Act requirements that's gonna, you know, hopefully lead to a lot of very exciting new building opportunities, conversion projects. Uh, upgrades, retrofits, and you go on and on and on. It's really an amazing time. Uh, super exciting, you know, that it's the potential is really unlimited from here on out. Um, I'm, I'm super excited. I don't know what to say about it. I know you yeah, have I, a lot more to say, but uh, since we've only got an hour, we're going to keep you, we're going to keep you uh, tied up here and not keep from saying, from, from taking time from everybody else. Uh, Jeff, if we kick it over to you, what do you see in terms of uh, what do we need to do to achieve the 30 by 30 goal? 
Yeah, I, I I would say Myra, there's there's three things that that I look at and that Crowley looks at as a company. Um, first and foremost is infrastructure. Um, so how do we develop all of the the port infrastructure, uh, the supply chain management that's going to be required to make 30 for 30 a reality? The other thing, and I, I hear this from Nick all the time, is Jeff, when are you guys going to build more assets? more ships and, and uh, yeah, without a doubt. Um, the, the challenge that we face as an industry right now is, as I think everybody knows, we only have uh, one wind turbine installation vessel that's Jones Act um, uh, available for, for the industry. Um, there's only a certain amount of tubs and barges that are gonna be capable of doing all this work. We definitely need more assets and we definitely need uh, folks like uh, Mike at Keppel uh, to have enough space uh, to be able to build those assets as well. And then the last thing uh, that we see is training. Um, this is a brand new industry, and, and you'll hear me say this multiple times during the, during the course of uh, the webinar today. It's a, a generational changing opportunity for all of us, not only on the call, but for, for young people who are in college or academies or high schools and have an opportunity to participate. Um, but they need to be trained. Uh, we don't know what we're doing. We don't know how to climb up a turbine and be able to uh, replace a, a blade or a nacelle. And so there has to be a dedicated training program, not only for the technicians, but the mariners as well, to be able to work on uh, some of the vessels that Nick mentioned, the CTVs, the SOVs, and certainly the wind installation vessels as well. Absolutely. Lots of, uh, I mean, certainly challenges, but so many opportunities within that space. Um, I suppose uh, Jeff or uh, Mike, Jeff teed it up quite well for you when it comes to uh, shipyard capacity. So I suppose I should turn it over to you if you want to to comment maybe from your end on what sure. needs to be done here for the 30 by 30 goal. I think I have the same question that Nick has is, Jeff, when are you guys going to build more vessels? <laughs> <laughs> I probably I probably speak for most of the shipbuilding uh, uh, shipyards in the U.S. is that you know there's a, a a pent up demand availability in these yards to produce these vessels. Um, obviously, we have one WTIV under construction in Brownsville, and we have capacity for more. Um, but it's it's delivering these vessels in a timely manner. The first fields are the installations are going to start in 2024. Uh, which is only a few years away, and and to get assets into the marketplace, we're going to have to get started now. Um, it takes three, two to three, four years to build these vessels. Um, I suppose we question. I guess it's a question for Dave later on: is how to deliver all this equipment. But uh, um, I, I believe the the industry has enough knowledge building PSVs and SOV. I mean. Uh, PSVs and uh, anchor handling tugs, et cetera, that they can make the jump to build these hybrid vessels that are pretty sophisticated. Are there additional, within that, is there additional um, uh, an additional, additional learning curve for these vessels that you see? And if there is, is there a, any sort of vision in place on how to kind of achieve that learning curve? Yeah, there's a learning curve, but you know, I, I, a lot of this, technology has been built uh, used in Europe now for quite a while and the, the experience is in Europe so we'll pull on that experience but it's incumbent I think on the manufacturers the, the, the suppliers of this equipment to work hand in hand with the yards to make sure that the, the equipment is installed correctly and in a timely manner that prevents delays um, and it, it offers a, a safer and a, a more reliable piece of equipment absolutely absolutely. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Mike. So, Dave, I think that uh, that leaves it to you to respond, and, and maybe you want to make a comment about the delivery of equipment. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I appreciate that, Mike. And first of all, I got to say, look, look at this panel. I, I love this being here with these guys, my friends, just being able to talk. This is this is awesome. Uh, and I told them next time I'm down in Houston, we have one of these. We'll just be sitting next to a bar or something, so we can make it feel a lot more relaxed. So, first of all, guys, thank thanks for being here. But you know. I, I really want to touch on something Mike said at the same time, <clears throat> and one of the reasons Mike and I get along so well, I'm an old shipyard dog, I uh, spent almost a decade in the shipyard, right? And, you know, when we start talking about the vessels and what's needed, it's extremely impressive how agile U.S. shipyards are. 
and how so easily, you know, the yard I was at, we started there when they had two lines running and we were at five by the time that I, I left that particular yard. And it's just uh, the agility that, that the U.S. shipyards have. And, and Mike, I don't know if, if you want to speak to some of that on the, all the different vessels that you guys have done a little bit later, but, you know, that that is this transition to offshore wind. But so specifically, though, what I like to say is the what's going to get us a 30 by 30 is really the focus on that supply chain, just like you guys have said, right? It's it's all about making it as efficient as possible. And as it, it, that's a huge goal. It really is. And the only way to get there is through that efficiency. One of the, the crazy things that we're in right now is, is actually also a, a confluence. So we are in the middle of this fourth industrial revolution at the same time that wind's coming along. And if those aren't familiar with it, so the first industrial revolution was steam back in the 17 and 1800s. We moved to electric in the 18 and 1900s and then computing. And then today it's intelligence and it's all the digitalization behind what we're doing um, in these fields. So it's the philosophy behind and some of the, the, uh, uh, the network for offshore wind and some other groups are doing some great work behind getting all of us behind this, this goal and as well that confluence behind that fourth industrial revolution. So what we need to look at is those philosophies behind making everything safer, more efficient. Um, and really that's, that's the goal of offshore wind anyway. It is how are we making this whole entire industry and how are we going to make energy more efficient? And it's in every single aspect of this. And just like Jeff said, with the training side, my gosh, you know, it, it's something brand new to us. And that's another thing that shipyards, education, something we're great at in the U.S. So it's it's something that I think the whole U.S. is really suited for. And the four of us and the companies that we have we bring a lot of that uh, to the end goal of 30 by 30. Absolutely, absolutely. I don't know if anybody has a comment that they want to throw out if that peaked a, a light bulb, but uh, if not, I'll move on. And I can already see we've got loads of questions that are stacking up here in the chat. So we'll work to try and get to some of those. Um, but rest assured, if we don't get to answer your question here live during the session, we will receive response in follow-up. Um, directly. So if uh, just to, to flag that for audience, feel free to submit questions and we'll, we'll work to get through as many as we uh, have time to get through. Um, with this development and really this industry being, it's been around for quite a long time in Europe and other parts of the world, but with it being new here in the US, relatively new, I mean, there are some turbines that are in existence. What do you see in terms of the trends to support the backbone of the offshore wind industry, um, which will be, you know, responsible for towards operation efficiency and sustainability, what you were just speaking about, Dave. Um, I don't know, maybe Nick, if you want to start that one off again and then we'll, we'll go sure. around my screen here. So I, we at DNV, we see a couple of, you know, primary trends really, really hitting home on this segment. Digitalization, uh, Dave talked about it, you know, data is key, data is king now. It's getting value out of that data everything, decision support systems, optimizing your energy layout, your environmental footprint, um, increasing automation. You know, we're seeing some early pilots of condition monitoring coming to the marine space. All those type of technologies is driven by data. Uh, decarbonization is, you know, a big part of what we're talking about today. We're talking about global decarbonization, moving to renewable power. Those expectations and demands are making its way to the maritime space as well. Um, Battery hybrid systems, I, I, I feel confident in saying at this point are the baseline, are becoming the baseline expectation, not so much a nice to have anymore. Um, as we move through this decade, uh, we'll see alternative fuels and, and maybe even towards the end of the decade, some very early uh, hydrogen or synthetic fuel, uh, ammonia driven vessels uh, being considered. Of course, a lot has to happen with that. We're also talking about shore charging and even offshore charging. Um, being discussed. Uh, overall, overarching all of this is the capability and the safety. I mean, we're talking also about an industry that we haven't put any commercial scale turbines in the water in the U.S. yet, but a 10 megawatt turbine is already yesterday's news. We're now looking at 12, 13 megawatt turbines. 
makes it very tough for for you know guys like Dave and Jeff and uh, and uh, excuse me Mike here that have to build and operate equipment for turbines that don't yet exist but we know they're coming they're going to be bigger more powerful further out at sea and above all it has to be safe uh, we can talk about safety for for days on end but um, I'll let someone else get a word in here rather than me talk the whole time yeah maybe Mike if we if we turn it over to you what uh, what do you see from your side well, luckily for us, you know, shipyards require a lot of horsepower, steel, you know, paint, piping, electrical. Luckily for us, these vessels are not reinventing the wheel. They exist already. Um, so we're taking technology that exists and we're bringing it to the U.S. to build. Um, so we're Americanizing existing design. Um, and the U.S. shipyards are quite capable of doing this. Um, I don't have a, my major concern or and maybe I'm speaking for other shipyards too, is, is the supply chain that we're going to need to, to give us the, the equipment that we have to have to build these things. Um, building a PSV hull or SOV hull is quite doable. It's obvious that you know we have huge fleets in the US. We can do all this stuff. You know, it, it, the equipment, installing it, commissioning these vessels is, is quite capable of doing it. You know, our yard in Brownsville is, a, is a specializes in building jack-up rigs. So, I mean, it's it's not a stretch for us to do any of this sort of stuff, but we need the supply chain to support it. Absolutely, absolutely. It's I mean, it's, uh, it's the knock-on effect. So it's the dominoes all have to line up for things to uh, to, to happen the way they need to. Uh, Mark, Jeff. I just have one thing to add on Mike's side and, and maybe he, he can add a little bit more, but, you know, and sorry, I, I probably interrupted our flow that we had going, but Mike's touched on something right there when, when he said, you know, his yard uh, on the jack-up side, these vessels, yeah, Mike, you're right, they, they've been built before and a lot of these technologies have been packed into these vessels before, but the U.S. yards haven't necessarily done them. Your guys' yard has. Um, and I think there still is some of that learning curve in certain ones, but you know it's all about that, that reputation of what some yards can bring compared to others, what yards are best at, and that goes back to that efficiency side. So I I just wanted to touch on that from Mike's side too that you know these these aren't uh, the simplest systems they they've been done before, but there are certainly yards like Mike's have done before. Yeah, I mean these. This, the, the WTIV is immense. It's bigger than a U.S. football field for people in the audience that aren't familiar with the design. You know, it, the, the legs of this rig would be in the stands. Um, that's how big it is. It covers the whole U.S. football field. So they're not small pieces of equipment. Uh, so it, it, you know, it takes a lot of work with the suppliers and the owners uh, and the designers to put one of these things together. And it's the same with the SOVs. Um, everybody has to work together. I, I keep harping on the same subject, but we're going to have to work as a team. Dave, thanks, thanks for stealing my thunder. <laughs> You're up, Jeff. I'll, I'll take it away. That's, that's not the way we rehearsed it. <laughs> I know. I know. My, my fault. My fault. I apologize, Jeff. No, 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 no. I, I, I echo exactly uh, about what, what Dave is saying. Um, I think we do have challenges around these these newer types of vessels, as Mike had mentioned, SOVs in particular, and, and also wind installation vessels as well. Um, the, the price of these vessels is, is extremely, extremely high right now. Uh, I, I would argue some of that is about, we're just not certain what that true cost is going to be. And, and we wanna make certain that, that we have enough in, in our bid packages to, to be able to uh, to meet the needs of, uh, of the customers. Um, I'll, I'll echo exactly though what Nick had said as far as digitalization is concerned, that is gonna be mission critical uh, and is huge part, not only from a, a, a vessel side, but also from a land side as well. When you start talking about marine coordination, when you think about um, everything that needs to be done, as Mike mentioned, on supply chain, inventory management, and then also when you get down to, just to the efficiency of the fields themselves. It's, it's a critical component, and I think right now we are slightly behind the curve of, of getting up to speed on that. Um, the other part that I think is, uh, is going to be critical as well, Myra, is it, it refers back to some of the costs of these vessels. And so it really is also gonna require some outside of the box thinking. 
Um, I, I do think there might be a little bit of sticker shock that's out there right now. And so what does that mean? How can you potentially do things different? Maybe you don't need an SOV. Maybe you get creative and, and you have a larger CTV and you have uh, that coupled with an accommodations barge and, and maybe a, um, a, a helicopter. I don't know, but, but I think what Mike said is, is critical. Um, working together and coming up with solutions, not trying to fit a, a square peg in, uh, in exactly a round hole. And again, I, I go back to what I've heard from both Mike and Nick, you know, we've been doing this for a long, long time as far as shipbuilding is concerned. I was in Norfolk last week and I was reminded on more than one occasion that we've been building ships in Virginia and in Norfolk for 400 years. And they're right. So it's not as if this is the first time we've done this. Uh, we've got to take some of that legacy and uh, combine it with some of the ingenuity uh, that we have today in order to meet the needs uh, in the 30 by 30 that we talked about earlier, Myra, uh, and I think we'll be fine. Fantastic. Dave, do you want to comment anything else? I've got a question from the audience that actually fits well within this, but if you had, if you wanted to add anything else to this, uh, this particular topic, I'll, I'll give you the opportunity to do so. Thank you. And I'm sorry, Myron, everybody knows me. And sometimes I just can't shut up. So, uh, no, I know. But, I said my but, work is cut out for me. I got the hardest job of this whole group. Exactly. And three guys here know that especially. But, you know, I think for us uh, at AVB, one of the biggest things that we're seeing in the trends in the U.S. is all the vessels that are, are being looked at are following that whole theme of offshore wind and sustainability and really enabling technologies that power the world without consuming the world is a big thing and it is it's really the, the key goal in offshore wind right um and at abb we do have our uh onboard dc grid which is fit perfectly for vessels for batteries hydrogen fuel cells digital auto autom automation it it has the mind of future proofing your vessels mm. and that's that's another big thing here is this industry is just now starting the vessel that we're building today is going to see numerous, just like Jeff said, we're not even really sure, do we need SOVs? Do we need some up, something else? I mean, we're, we're really trying to figure out what that is and, you know, in systems that we can assist, we can help with, uh, at, at that point, it's looking at 30 years in the future, you're set up, you're ready to go for future fuels. Um, I'm not going to give my flux capacitor spiel on this one, but it's you can throw any type of power into a vessel and we'll be able to consume that power for the systems you have, along with the digital side to do it as efficiently as possible. So I'll leave it at that. Sorry, Myra. You go, you go oh, right no, ahead. No, perfect. It's perfect. Um, it just building, building a bit on this discussion, we had a question come in from the audience regarding uh, what developers, vessel designers, OEM, integrators are doing to reduce capex costs when it comes to building vessels here in the u.s and the impacts of the jones act um kind of shifting beyond the european designs and then the standards does anyone have comments or can anyone comment or perhaps pose some ideas on what might be happening or what might be um under consideration as far as as th that is concerned well, I, I'll add to that, Myra. So, you know, certainly with our team on the, on the Crowley engineering side, um, we're trying to look at how we might repurpose existing assets. Um, so we, we talk about, for example, uh, our fleet of, um, of articulated tugs and barges. Some of them are, are no longer going to be fit for purpose for the Petroleum Services Group. So how can we retrofit those vessels uh, to make them an articulated tug barge unit that can be able to uh, to work uh, on uh, on doing the TNI portion uh, for uh, for offshore wind? At the same time, you know we have come up with other opportunities, other solutions as it pertains to uh, say nearshore cable A barges. Um, there's also uh, opportunities around retrofitting existing assets, tugs and barges, again, in an articulated tug barge format. And it really gets back to what I mentioned earlier. It's, it's how do you think a little bit outside of the box? How do you work together with your customer, whoever that is, OEM, developer, installer, 
uh, together in order to come up with the most efficient solution that is uh, that is available. It, it might not be as beautiful as the uh, the wind insulation vessel that my good friend Mr. Uh, Mr. Holcomb is building, but if it gets the job done uh, and the customer is happy and everybody is safe at the end of the day, um, then I think it'll work. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm going to just add something to that. Go right ahead, Mike. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, um, go right ahead. We're seeing a, 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 a quite a bit of a change in the in the type of vessels that are coming at us now. A few years ago was it was do it like they do in Europe with bringing the WTIVs out and um, you know based on a European setup it, it, it's hard for that to work here and like Jeff said there, there's a lot of different opportunities based on East Coast port facilities that lend other types of vessels and we're starting to see them more and more in the yard um, inquiries coming in for different types of vessels so that, like you said we have to think our way through this. There's opportunities, and we just have to be flexible and, and uh, make it work. Myra, I'll, I'll add to that. Mike brought up a great point. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of challenges here in the United States to go back to port infrastructure, where you have air draft restrictions, you have hurricane barriers, you have uh, um, Department of Defense uh, issues as well. And, and all of that um, doesn't make this again a, a, a perfect fit. So it, it really is important on us to be able to work together. As I as I continue to mention, it, it, this is not going to be done by one company by themselves. It's going to take partners. Um, it's going to take competitors that were partners as well uh, in order to see this through to uh, to its successful fruition. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I, I know Nick well enough to see the wheels spinning in his head. And I also know that we've recorded some some vlog video in the past regarding retrofitting of vessels. So Nick, I'm gonna throw that over to you with regards to sort of where from your, you know, the, the research that you've done and, and the partners that you've been collaborating with in Europe, um, you know, how you have sort of seen this and perhaps the forecast, maybe short term, long term, where this what the picture may look like um, when it comes to to retrofitting and, and utilizing vessels for for other purposes and not building necessarily right out the bat purpose-built vessels yeah um i think you know guys like mike are just sitting back and licking their chops when they look at the demand that's coming and shipyard availability i mean if you take sovs alone um i think i've been on the record saying i see by the end of this decade uh over a dozen needed, you know, if we're going to go with that model. Um, I'm not going to speak for all yards here, but, you know, three, two, two, three year build time of that overlapping, yards fill up quick. It's going to be full. So just like, like Jeff said, everyone's going to get their, 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 their shot at one and, and more than one. So tremendous, tremendous opportunity. So yeah, retrofit, conversions, upgrades, absolutely. Um, to, to add on what Dave and Jeff said earlier, earlier, the U.S. has a very capable maritime fleet, a very sizable fleet. Jeff is one of the largest owners of a big part of that. Um, absolutely, you know, utilize tools that are available to you. Um, and I saw on that question in the audience, will it be a longer term or shorter term? I would say probably towards the shorter term. I mean, it it's, goes back to operability, suitability for the task at hand. Some of those could be very well long-term applications and, and, and lifetime ones, but the SOV case specifically, there's a quite a strong um, operational uh, pressure and stress on the operational availability, on the efficiency of that vessel. Um, CapEx, of course, plays into that, but I think the, the let's not sleep on the operability and getting these technicians safely, securely on these repeated uh, transfers to these turbines. So that would be my my short long answer to that. Absolutely. Nick, just to be just to save my own job, um, to be clear, I don't own those vessels. Um, my ultimate boss does, Mr. Crowley. But I just wanted to make <laughs> no, this he was watching. This session is being recorded. Yes. No. <laughs> and Dave, I would be amiss if I did not tee it up for you to also comment, and maybe you can can perhaps share some insight talking about the systems on board, um, you know, these existing vessels and, and what goes into the picture when it comes to outfitting them and, and the retrofits to, you know, 
get them ready for their their new mission. Yeah, and and I. I mean, this is the the capex question with retrofit. It's a huge question. It, it really is. I mean, um, it's we could spend an hour on that alone. I know. Yes, that's, that's exactly right. And you know, I, I completely agree with with the four guys here. And, and this is kind of uh, one of the examples of us coming together and talking about some of these things. I mean, even before at the webinar, the four of us have been talking about many different things, uh, not just including what's what's going on here, but it, it really is, I mean, we've seen offshore wind coming for a while, but there's a lot of aspects in it. And still, it's here now, and there's tons of questions still be, to be answered. Um, and it's really, you know, again, like the group right here getting together and saying, how can we de-risk this as much as possible with guys like Mike in the shipyard? Because as in, we're building any new type of vessel, there could be new regulations, new requirements. So, you know, from Mick's side of things, hey, what's your guidance on what needs to be included in this vessel? And then Jeff, hey, what is the uh, the developer really needing out of the vessel? Sometimes it comes down to the owners are, are really asking more than what's required, which is going to just increase the CapEx costs. But there may be a good reason behind it. You know, it, it's just, but having those conversations really starts to drill down into reducing that overall CapEx cost. And, you know, it, it's no different. I mean, I tell everybody all the time, look at the automotive industry and what they're doing. And that ends up happening in the marine industry in about 10 years or so. Even in the automotive industry, I think yesterday, the, uh, the uh, Ford announced their new electric uh, F-150, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be the most expensive right now. And then the, reduce, the cost starts reducing from there. The first out is usually always the most expensive, but to the, the question and, and to Jeff, because that's always, when I talk to Jeff, what's, you know, it's always about trying to reduce that CapEx and increasing the, the payback on the efficiency side. We can still, we need to do that by working together. And then on the retrofit fleet, can we make that happen with those vessels that are existing, utilizing, you know, again, the, the guys that are here saying, what are the shipyard's capabilities? Um, are the existing uh, automation suites that are inside of these uh, efficient enough or do we need to do a, a whole brand new rip out and replace? That's, that's one of the biggest things and uh, this past week I was in several conversations. We always talk about the stuff we can see. We talk about the, the iPhone that's in our hand, right? We don't talk about the automation that's behind it. I can't believe I just spent a thousand dollars to buy a phone for my wife for a piece of glass all right and a battery and that's that's what we talk about because those are the things we can tangibly see but it's all the automation and the brains behind it is really what we're paying for so does it make sense in some of these retrofits knowing some of the efficiency items we're going to need the digitalization the safety to retrofit those and the only way we're going to find out is working with jeff on what is the developer requirement Having Nick there saying, here's what we see from regulatory and working with the guys in the shipyard to try to drive that price down as much as possible. At the end of the day, they come back to me at ABB and say, it's still too expensive. We, we need to drive the price. I understand that. <laughs> but it, it, that's, that's the only way to get there. Absolutely. I think that's the, that's the key is collaboration is going to be essential to move this industry forward in a productive manner and uh, to do it in the fashion and, the, and in the time frame that's necessary. So bringing, bringing all the heads to the table and, and throwing all the, uh, all the discussion topics out for discussion to really hash it out um, is, is the only way forward. I guess if I could summarize that in 20 seconds, but uh, not to drag that topic because we could, we could spend an hour, I think, talking about just this, but to, uh, to make sure we touch on um, the figures in terms of like the personnel, because I mentioned some of the statistics, the thousands of jobs, the thousands of, of lives that will be impacted with the development of this industry. Um, with this being a whole new operation in the U.S., what do you guys see is going to help the U.S. industry keep our mariners as safe as possible while at sea doing what are, in a sense, new jobs or at least the traditional job in a new way? And maybe, Jeff, this might be the best one to tee up to you to begin with. Yeah, thanks, Myra. Um, you know, 
first and foremost, as I mentioned early on, I think you're, you're talking about training. Training is going to be critical, uh, especially as I mentioned earlier, as it pertains to uh, the new vessels that are going to be employed uh, for offshore wind. And I'd be remiss without saying, you know, we, we still need to be able to think about the training that's going to be required for those individuals who are going to be working on those turbines as well. Um, that, that is uh, another critical component. The other part that I think is interesting uh, and that we talk about a lot here at, at Crowley is um, how there is going to be some level of digitalization that's going to be played out for the safety and the security of not only the mariners, but everybody involved in offshore wind. And by that, I mean, if you think about today, the, the ship traffic that's going to be occurring going you know, north to south, and then you think about the traffic with all of these vessels, I think Nick had mentioned maybe 500 or maybe 400 as it just is in comparison to what happened in Europe. That's a huge increase in ship traffic with boats, barges, as we've talked about here. Uh, and so how can we make certain that there's not gonna be an increase in, uh, in accidents uh, that are going to put our mariners certainly in, in harm's way. The other thing that's critical to understand, and I realize it's not a direct effect with your mariners, but how do we avoid situations that occurred here most recently with the Colonial Pipeline? How do we make certain that ransomware is not going to attack our systems uh, that, that are currently going to be supporting offshore wind or potentially millions and millions of homes could be without electricity for an infinite amount of time. Those are all very, very key components that we need to, to tackle together. Uh, again, with, with, our, um, with our legislator, uh, with the Coast Guard and other port authorities as, um, as we move forward. Absolutely. And maybe Dave, it's, it's appropriate for you to jump in at this point because I know that that's one of the areas that you focus on you know, within your regular day-to-day -day business. That's exactly right. And, you know, to Jeff's point, I'll go back to what one of the things I said earlier with the fourth industrial industrial revolution of intelligence. We're there now. We're, uh, we see Tesla and other companies with, you know, autonomous vehicles. Um, and again, what I said before is wait 10 years or so, five, 10 years, and we'll have that in the marine industry. Uh, at ABB, we have two vessels we've already undertaken that are autonomous, a ferry and a tug uh, around the world. And the, I'll, I'll touch on first cybersecurity because everybody sees that. Again, going back to what do we see in the, in the public eye and what happened to the pipeline, that is of utter importance at ABB. Um, and with these new vessels and the uh, automation that we have in them, it's built with the um, cybersecurity as first, not later. A lot of the older systems that have been utilized around the world and not in just vessels, but cybersecurity was an afterthought. Who was ever going to hack into me controlling a valve on a pipeline? You know, there was never even a thought. Today, we're saying who's going to hijack a container ship um, because they can have full control over it because it's such an automated system. And as we look at the vessels for offshore wind, they're getting there. They, they really are, um, and you know, in our ABB uh, Marine Pilot Suite, we have a lot of things that assist um, that fork directly on control. We do uh, auto crossing, braking assistance. It's all done um, in that automation world, but all those are done in the mind of making the mariners on that vessel as safe as possible, to, to Jeff's point. Um, all these vessels that are coming through in our uh, pilot vision suite, we have lookout assistance, docking assistance, fairway assistance. Fairway, we can actually tell the difference between a seagull flapping its wings on the water and a person waving their hands that's in the water. Uh, and then utilize the system like braking assistance, know to break or not. Um, it, it's all trying to make everything as safe as possible. Auto docking, when you get to the dock or to the turbine itself. Uh, you know, making the, the job easier. And then on the flip side of it, on the uh, our, our octopus suite, it is all about looking at weather, looking at waves, uh, predictive analysis um, 
on, hey, let's not leave the dock right now to go out and just sit in DP or wait to get into DP and burn fuel. Let's wait two hours or so, then we'll travel out there at this particular speed and we can go directly into DP. Um, again, all those are, are, are with that cybersecurity in mind, but uh, that is where we're going to get to a safer, more efficient industry to support uh, what's going on right now. Fantastic, thank you, thank you, Dave. Mike, what about from, from your side when it comes to uh, focus areas for, for training and for increasing safety? Um, what do you want to share for thoughts? It's always tough to follow Dave because he's so eloquent, doesn't leave much to talk about, so. Um, <laughs> no, but I think I'm from the shipyard side. You can pick a different side, question if you'd like. <laughs> from, from the shipyard side, you know, we have to build these things and we have to commission them and, and make sure they're running right. So to make them viable pieces of machinery, we have to start staffing up the people that know how to design these things. You know, we do the detailed design, we do the construction. So we have to increase the skill sets in those areas to make sure these things are functional. Um, so we're putting out a good product. That's, I think that's probably the most important step change that the yards have to make. And like I said before, we have to cooperate with the suppliers and the designers to make sure that happens. Very good, very good. And Nick, that leaves, that leaves it to you. Yeah, so I mean, just to, to kind of round up what everyone said here, safety is without a doubt paramount. And the number one um, factor here, you know, could derail offshore wind so quickly if it, if it happens unsafe. And we're talking about a really unique situation here in, you know, you look at the jack up vessel like Mike's building, making jacking operations every other day, um, handling massive loads at high delicate components and blades, uh, you know, it's a lot of moving parts. You talk about the SOVs like Jeff was mentioning about, um, going turbine to turbine every couple hours, connecting that gangway, persons going across in inclement weather. Um, you know, this comes as no surprise, should come as no surprise, offshore wind areas are windy, you know, and, and transfer at 30 meters above sea, 35 meters above sea, um, that's quite something, you know, on a moving vessel in waves and wind conditions. So technology will drive the safety. And, and again, the data we talked about is absolute paramount to ensure correct decisions are being fed to the vessel, um, knowing at all time, you know, where the vessel's at, what's safe, and, and when is it in its operating envelope to do exactly what it needs. Very good, thank you. We got an interesting question from, and, and I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to ask this, but I'm, I'm also interested to hear your thoughts. We got an interesting question from the audience um, and in comparing, comparing and compress, contrasting offshore winds to the oil and gas industry and in the oil and gas industry, the vessel oversupply. We should anticipate taking some lessons learned and I'm seeing some sm slight smirks, so I'm not sure if anybody actually wants to comment on this. What can we do to help ensure we do not overbuild for this market? Now, don't all jump at once and, and let me know who wants to respond first. And Mike is actually sitting back saying, I'll build if you ask me to build. So, but my, yeah, let me, let me, since I was in the middle of that in the shipbuilding industry, the oil and gas, it's the marine industry, we, we don't know how to pull back on the reins. Uh, a lot of times, we really don't. We see an opportunity, we all run for it, we all you know, see what's there. I think the temperament here is going to be uh, some of the uh, the vessels and their, their cost and what's required for US offshore wind compared to uh, some of the oil and gas, but um, it, it that's a very good question because as, as I saw, I was in the middle of it, it we like to build and everybody likes to build at the same time knowing that uh, there could be some a drop at the end so i i'll, I'll start it with that and then head to the other guys too and then i see mike's nodding so i know mike has thoughts in his head so mike why don't you take the next to the next response there well, we're shipyards are greedy so we'll take all we can get <laughs> <laughs> i agree mike. remember yep. this is being recorded <laughs> <laughs> you delete that part <laughs> No, I think that, uh, you know, it's it's a tendency that everybody has, but at the end of the day, I, because of the cost of these these vessels, I don't think that there's going to be much speculative construction. 
Um, you're talking a heck of a lot of cash. Um, and these guys, are, I think the operators or, or the contractors are going to be looking for a day rate contract of some time to be able to pay these things out. So I think that will mitigate it a little bit. Um, there's a lot of people flowing into the market now, but I think at the end of the day, the cost will, will drop them. It's a high barrier for entry. Yeah, I, I can maybe add on to that and, and Jeff can tell me I'm wrong afterwards, but we're seeing that I think for certain like the SOV model, the industry tech is, so for what I've seen so far, looking at longer term contracts, um, five, seven and a half, some even, I've heard some in other parts of the world, 10 year plus contracts being issued. So it's somewhat different in that SOVs are very bespoke, very custom, even though they're all quite similar. When this vessel goes to work, it's dedicated to that field for perhaps the next 10 years, um, not necessarily competing out in the open market to find new work. Now, some some operators do off work on a different model where they contract shorter term, but the trend for now seems to be towards longer term contracts. Uh, and again, com compared, uh, considering the cost of building this vessel, I think, I forget if it was Dave who said it, building on spec doesn't seem very likely at this point for, for SOV certainly. CTVs, that's gonna be a bloodbath. I mean, uh, that, that's gonna be a different story, but SOVs and WTIVs purpose built with orders in hand. Okay, so and Jeff? I, no, I, and, and, and Myra, I, I, I would agree. I mean, we as a company are not going to build uh, a vessel on spec, you know, certainly with, we're going to build when we have a contract at the end of the day. I, I think the challenge that we have here is, is a real balancing act for, for the industry. And, and it really pertains in my mind around how we're going to do the installation, as I think we talked about early on, and the balance between additional WTIVs or more barges and tugs or something that might be there in between. Uh, and again, I, I think today's prices for barges that are, are similar to our own, the 455 series, um, are, are fairly high. And, and you're going to have to have a, a, a certain amount of work to be able to cover those costs. And given where things are at right now in the oil and gas industry, um, it's not as if once you're done with, uh, with offshore wind, if you go out and build more of those barges, there might be more opportunities for you down the road in the oil and gas market. So yeah, it, it, we're gonna have to be very sensitive to that and try to figure out where there is, uh, where's that middle ground. I mean, we're talking about that internally right now. I'm certain our competitors are, are doing the same thing. So it, it, is, uh, it is a huge challenge that, that we're faced with and something that we're gonna have to uh, address sooner rather than later given when things are supposed to get started. Absolutely. Well, good answers. I, I like this crystal ball uh, vision that you've got. So we'll see here in, in a decade how things turn out, I suppose. Uh, we've got that's a bit why, of time. That's left. why Nick wants me to be the owner of the vessels because he knows I build them in a heartbeat. I do anything for him. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> So we do have a few few more minutes, so we'll uh, tackle a couple other questions. Um, talking perhaps about uh, fuels for these vessels when it comes to um, types of fuels, alternative fuels. What what are we talking about here? Um, I know Nick, you you've discussed a couple options, but maybe Dave, if I kick it to you, do you want to start with a comment there as far yeah, as I, discussions so far that you've been having? There's there's a definite distinction between what's available today and what's going to be available in 30 years, uh, and we we got to make sure we distinguish between the two of those. Uh, I I think we've already talked about today there is uh, definitely batteries uh, as an alternative fuel source in these vessels on top of the diesel engines that uh, are as typical. Uh, we do see fuel cells. Uh, there are our vessels being built around the world world uh, as fuel cell integration. But it all translates to what's available. Is uh, gaseous hydrogen available? Is liquid hydrogen available? Nick already brought up ammonia as a future fuel. It's. I think those are going to be there, but it's in the best, I think I said earlier, the vessel today, you have to keep that in mind when you're building these that, and it's moving extremely fast. 
compared to we've seen diesel engines for how long? And then just the last 10 years, we went from batteries to hydrogen fuel cells. We're already talking about ammonia. So it, today, it's going to be that battery with uh, hydrogen fuel cells in mind. Uh, come to me again, like you said, Myra, in 10 years, let's see what the fleet looks like and see where the fuel is there. Uh, I think it's going to be something completely different. All right. Nick, Nick, what do you want to comment here? I know you, you mentioned a few things at the beginning, but uh, as far as fuels and and maybe you want to echo the same sentiments i i think it's like they've said it's no one knows if, if anyone knows what the fuel of the future will be they can strike it rich really soon on that um you know the the recent very recent topic of offshore charging charging buoys out in the offshore wind farm itself uh open up a whole new dimension uh being able to take some of that power there and charge uh, the operational profile of SOVs is, you know, a lot of time on DP or even, you know, virtually not moving, very, very minimal power consumption, not necessarily steaming. So that opens up for potential to maybe down the road have a full electric SOV operating in the field. A um, lot of interest right now on fuel cell technology, whether that's uh, LOHC or from an ammonia base, uh, hard to know. It's very hard to know, but certainly the trend is towards electrification. Um, and I, think, I think the hydrogen angle will, although longer term, that will dominate later uh, throughout offshore wind developments. All right, and then Mike, Jeff, I leave it for a toss up because Mike, I know you're having conversations and Jeff, I know you've got thoughts and you're having conversations within your organization. So anything you wanna add? I, the only thing I, I will say is, you know, Myra, from our point of view right now, we look at it as it's critical for us, uh, certainly from a sustainability standpoint, um, it, that, that we begin to design vessels uh, that are going to be utilizing, you know, green power as we move forward. Whether that is, again, like Dave and, and Nick mentioned, is that going to be electric CTVs? Is that going to be hydrogen powered SOVs? You know, the challenge that we've laid out to the Crowley engineering team is please come up with designs um, that we can begin to look at and begin to hopefully push forward sooner rather than later, um, because you don't want to wait until 2040. You want to have those things in the water, uh, you know, hopefully by the end of, uh, of this decade um, so that uh, you can test them make certain that they're running correctly. And like Dave mentioned, make them, uh, uh, as we move forward closer to 2040, uh, make them that they are, are price um, sensitive uh, to, uh, to our customers. Absolutely. And Mike, do you have any final comments you wanna add here on this topic? Again, as a builder, you know, this new technology, we have to deal with it. We're building an LNG container ship in Brownsville. There's been other LNG vessels built in the U.S., but as you change from different types of fuels, you have different safety concerns, different, you know, environments, and you have to work very closely with class and Coast Guard to make sure you design these things correctly. Um, they're not so familiar with it all the time. So as we get a new technology, they're learning as well as you are so far. I keep repeating the fact we all have to work together, but it's a learning curve all the way. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are about out of time, but I do want to last ask one final question. And if I could do it, like you have 10 seconds or one sentence to respond, I would, but I'll give you a little bit more than that. So if we're a minute or two over, I apologize. It's my fault for not keeping the time. When it comes to the developments here and, and sort of the outlook for the future, I want to know from each of you what has you the most excited about where the industry is today and where we're headed. Um, Dave, if you've got a thought you want to throw out on that. Again, as you guys know, I always have a thought. So, uh, but in, in only this, one. I just need one. <laughs> yeah, in, in in this particular one, I mean, this is something that doesn't come come along every day. This is a brand new industry in the United States. There's huge opportunity for everybody. You know, we start talking about jobs. We start talking about Mike said on or Jeff said on the training side, um, but it is again a way to move the United States forward in the energy field, um, doing the right thing, not consuming the earth. Um, and uh, with that, working for a company like ABB, that that is our exact sustainability goal. 
Uh, it, it partners so well with, with the whole idea of offshore wind. Um, and again, it's just that huge opportunity in front of us, uh, not only at ABB, but for, but for my friends here on the call. Absolutely. Mike, on your side, what has you the most excited? Well, I think it's the challenges that these, these, uh, this, this new business throws at us. You know, we're, we're building a jack up rig that's the size of a football field. Um, you know, we have uh, potential SOVs that, you know, that can operate and put people on a, a platform of three meter seas. It's so there's a lot of naval architect, marine engineers, things that make our guys excited. So for us, it's a, it's a new product. And so it's a challenge. That's fantastic. Jeff, your thoughts. Yeah, yeah I, I, I go back a little bit of what Dave said and, and also what I mentioned early on. Uh, this is a generational changing opportunity. Uh, there's individual who I respect very highly, Ed, Ed Crowley, who mentioned that to me early on about offshore wind. Um, and I'm excited that we have, all of us here on this call, have an opportunity to, to participate in that. As, uh, as I tell the story sometimes, um, when, when I talk to, uh, to students uh, about what, what's to come in the future and I say to them, and they're scared, they wanna know, wow, where, where am I gonna go? Where can I participate? And I say, you could get involved in this industry and uh, you could be a, um, somebody who climbs up and down turbines and does that repair. And uh, in five years time, you could be a subject matter expert at 25 or 26 years old. That's just amazing for me to think about. And, and it gives me chills even right now to, to see that to see that occur. And uh, as, as I've said to the, the folks here on the call, um, my fellow panelists, uh, what I look forward to is when I get to, to retire and look back on all the work that we have done together you know, individually and also, you know, for us at Crowley as a company and companies overall, and to say, I had a part in that. that that's, that's really cool that uh, you can say, as part of my legacy, I had a part in a, in a brand new industry that's going to be around for years and years for your children, uh, their children, their children, and, and moving forward. So, so all good Absolutely. stuff. I should have come to you last, Jeff, because that just hit me in all the feels. But Nick, what what do you want to follow that with? I don't know how you can follow that, but it's just, you know, to reiterate it and what an amazing time to be able to, if you start today, you're still in the first wave, right? Because it's very early on, nothing to find. What an amazing opportunity to be part of a new industry, something starting up from virtually zero, but having a very strong backbone with offshore experience here, very transferable, just amazing. And and again, you know, I, I told Jeff before, I'm stealing that quote for other meetings that I do. Um, the chance to do something that has a lasting impact that will extend beyond my career, you know, and they're on for, for my grandkids as well. It's just phenomenal. It's amazing. So I'm, I'm just super ecstatic to be part of this and, and be part of this panel today. I think it's a phenomenal time ahead for the U.S. offshore wind industry. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think uh, based on our audience participation and, and I can see because I have to scroll heavily through the list of questions that this is something that we, I think, need to consider doing again um, in the future. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us for this special webinar today. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Um, and I'm gonna speak for my fellow panelists who, who were smiling throughout. I think we all had a fantastic time. Um, and, and we will review your questions that you have sent um, and follow up with you individually to get you a response. And I think amongst ourselves, we need to consider going on the road and maybe the next time around we will have a backyard barbecue discussion and we can pull out the IT equipment and virtually stream it to an audience who can join us with their own backyard barbecue um, perhaps when we're able to be more socially gathered that is but I uh, thank you so much to all the panelists today for your participation and contribution and for those in attendance thank you for joining us until next time everyone stay safe and take care all right Thank you. Thanks, Myra.